Hi everybody. So we're getting ready to kind of take our next step uh, into talking a little bit about personal genomics and uh, some of the applications, but also to follow up on our conversation about forensics. And uh, of course, uh, what we haven't really talked about is where do you get DNA? Where does DNA, obviously we know DNA exists in cells, and especially in eukaryo eukaryotes, a lot of DNA exists in the cells. However, uh, I'd like to talk about it a little bit uh, from the perspective of what biological samples or what biological matrices exist, especially when it comes to forensic evidence, and then of course the kind of chemistry behind the evaluation of both the biological uh, samples uh, as well as DNA itself. Uh, one of my former graduate students, in fact my first PhD student, uh, Butch Sizemore, uh, is the Associate Director of the FBI's DNA Crime Lab in Albuquerque, New Mexico, uh, and does uh, some really interesting work and a about half or so of the slides that I'm including uh, in here are, are slides that he uses to train FBI agents on how to collect uh, biological evidence and kind of talk about it a little bit uh, in terms that perhaps uh, people without biology degrees uh, get exposure to. So some of them I think are a little simplistic, some of them are pretty funny, which is one of the reasons that I use it. But then again, the uh, the chemistry portions I think are really important for you to get a hold of. So uh, when we talk about biolog biological evidence, especially in the context of uh, forensic investigation, what they are is uh, collections of some kind of a sample and obviously you can think of all sorts of biologicals. Blood is probably the one that you think of the most but certainly DNA also exists uh, in semen samples, uh, saliva samples, hair samples and hair is kind of a special case. We already talked about mitochondrial DNA existing uh, on the shaft of the hair itself, but remember that the follicle of the hair contains cellular material and so, and also a blood vessel, so it contains quite a bit of DNA, but also remembering that bone can, uh, rather DNA can exist inside bone. Bone is a living tissue, a specialized form of that, of course, is your tooth, and uh, very important uh, for archaeological examination, very often the DNA that is in the center of a tooth or the center of a bone uh, is actually capable of being extracted and DNA analysis done. We hopefully get a chance to talk a little bit about that on Wednesday, but also muscle tissue, uh, any kind of uh, skin, uh, sloughing off of the epidermis, all sorts of biological evidence. It I continue to remind you that biological evidence collected anywhere is circumstantial evidence, okay? Uh, circumstantial evidence. Just because you leave your DNA somewhere does not mean that you are uh, the person who committed or experienced a crime. Okay, so it is circumstantial by evidence. It is not direct evidence of a crime having been committed. Uh, of course, what we're really talking about is direct transfer of DNA from one individual to another. Uh, it could be an object, and the idea is to link a suspect to a particular crime scene or to identify a victim uh, that may be missing or perhaps uh, has been uh, killed or has had other issues with them. So uh, evident, the evidentiary uh, protocols are extremely important. Some of this you probably have picked up by watching 
uh, NCIS or CSI or some of the variety of different TV shows over the years. Uh, mostly you have to avoid contamination of samples. Don't put any of your DNA as the collector into the sample itself. Uh, lately, uh, I think the TV shows have gotten a little bit more sophisticated. Uh, mostly people are actually using latex gloves. Again, think about people making TV. They're looking to make it visually interesting. So, of course, people wear colored latex gloves. It's really nice to get that blue color, sometimes purple, sometimes all sorts of things. So, uh, but the reality is you need to clean, use clean latex gloves for every item of evidence you touch, okay? In other words, you don't want to pick up something, put it into an evidence bag, and then go over and pick up another item because what you're going to do is you're going to transfer the biological material from one item to another item to another item. So always have to change your latex gloves in between touching anything. They don't do that so much on TV. Same thing with instruments used to collect any kind of evidence. Every time something touches something, you always see some bonehead detective on TV using a pair of tweezers or a pen to pick up something. Great idea, except you can't use the same pen to pick up a variety of things unless it has been properly cleaned. Uh, believe it or not, when you're using a pen, I'm leaving my DNA on this pen just as I'm holding it right now. You, the detectives do the same thing. So a pen is not an appropriate instrument to pick up any piece of evidence, assuming that you plan on getting biological information from it. Every bit of evidence is stored in a separate package. Uh, all of the stains have to be thoroughly air dried before sealing a package. Take a moment. Think about that for a minute. Why does a sample need to be air dried before you seal a package? Give you a clue. Do you ever leave a loaf of bread on top of the refrigerator for a week or so in plastic and see what happens to it over time? Of course, it turns moldy. Okay, so you get tremendous mold and bacterial growth, which can have several different negative effects on the evidence. First of all, the living things begin to digest the DNA inside the biological sample that you want. Second of all, because mold and fungi are eukaryotes, and remember from looking at uh, some of the samples in the last lecture that we talked about, there are a lot of similarities between genes in all eukaryotes, and so yeast or fungus contaminations in biological samples can cause false positives as well. So you have really big problems with storage of biological. Again, same thing, always stored in paper bags, not plastic for the same reason. Of course, on TV and in movies, this is no good because if you have a bloody knife that you want to show people, you have to have it in a clear plastic bag. Holding up a paper bag that you can't see through is bad dramatic effect, okay? So don't get your forensic ideas or information from just watching the TV shows. Uh, collection of samples on immovable surfaces uh, basically are done uh, generally uh, with transferring sterile cotton swabs and distilled water. Uh, you rub the stain with a moist swab to transfer the stain onto the swab. Very often you'll see somebody poke the swab into a plastic tube right away. Uh, this is a bad idea. You have to store it once it's dried. So you allow the swab to dry out and then store it in individual paper envelope. All right.
There are a variety of collection techniques. And as I said, this swab technique is, uh, is kind of the classic. Generally, there's the double swab method, which is much better than the single swab, which you've probably seen on TV. The first swab is actually used just to wet the surface uh, with sterile water letting it sit for a moment to hydrate the cells, and then a second swab is used to go over and to actually collect the cells. Uh, swabs have to be digested with cellulase to improve d DNA yield. Again, makes a bit of sense, right? Because what are the swabs made of? Cotton. What's cotton made of? Cellulose. It's a plant product. So we have to get rid of the, as much cellulose as possible so we recover more cells and recover more DNA. In the modern world, uh, adhesive tape, it basically it's an acetate-based tape with sticky, one sticky side, uh, is really the preferred method. This eliminates a lot of uh, contamination from samples, and you take a bit of sample tape, push it down onto the biological material, and then you basically swipe it, and then you fold the tape over onto itself so the biological is uh, basically trapped between the two layers of tape. Really pretty cool. And then they use a little paper punch to punch holes out of the tape. They are placed in an extraction buffer, and the extraction buffer digests the acetate and DNA can be then extracted. So this is a pretty cool and very modern technique. A lot of advantages. And if you think about it for a moment, uh, I'm sure you can uh, figure it out as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. DNA collection cards uh, are also important when collecting original samples. Uh, and you can kind of see there are a couple of different DNA collection cards here. Uh, sorry for the lack of clarity in some of these cards. Let me get my pen up and running here. Uh, pen. There we go. Uh, and uh, you can kind of see the different collection cards. One can use the collection cards to collect saliva or to collect blood. These are very, very similar to the cards that are used uh, with newborn babies. Newborn babies you've probably seen again on TV if you haven't been present during a birth. Uh, they take a footprint of the baby so that way it's kind of like a fingerprint. They can identify the baby. But in today's world they also prick the heel of the baby uh, with a small sharp object and they are able to collect a spot of blood. Uh, this is a special, this DNA collection paper is a co special, highly purified cotton paper. Again, cotton, very common. Why do you think cotton is used to collect DNA? I'll give you a clue. Cotton has a very strong positive charge. What charges DNA? So should it stick? Think about it. Let you answer it. These DNA collection cards are actually embedded with an anticoagulant. Uh, probably 25 to 30 years ago, uh, heparin was used to prevent clotting, okay? But these days, EDTA is used. Remember, EDTA is ethylene diamine tetraacetic acid, and it was one of the questions that you should remember from laboratory. Why do we add EDTA to biological samples, especially for DNA extraction? It was in the plasmid extraction buffer, during our laboratory illustrating how GFP recombinants can be made with E. coli. Why is EDTA important? You should be able to answer that question. If you don't remember, 
check it out. Secondarily, once you know that reason, why then is it in an <clears throat> excuse me, why then is it an anticoagulant? Another important biochemistry point. Here's our paper bags. You may have seen these on TV. Certain shows uh, actually use this to good effect. If anybody has Netflix, there's a show from the BBC called Broadchurch. And on Broadchurch, one of the few shows I've seen where they actually effectively use paper bags, not all the time, but occasionally utilize paper bags for evidence collection, especially in season three. So you can double check that and see if it is consistent with some of the ideas we talk about. The bag, of course, has a chart on the outside. It is extremely important as we're to be able to fill in all of the information about where and how the evidence was collected. And of course, a critical element is the chain of possession. In court cases, it is very important to know that no one has ever tampered with the evidence. And so the chain of custody or chain of possession is critical so that the evidence is never left alone so that there is no one who can be accused of tampering with the evidence. So every time the evidence changes hands, someone has to indicate when, where, for what purpose, uh, and of course the date and the time that the evidence is in their possession. Court cases have been lost when trying to convict a suspect because evidence was not taken care of properly and there was a period of time where no one knew who had possession of the evidence. So an extremely important legal point. And again, we see this here. This is just a summary talking about uh, some of the details that we just went over. Evidence has to be properly packaged, labeled, and sealed. Has to be kept dry and at room temperature. Uh, did you ever wonder why the CSI vans, when they pull up in movies and TV, are these huge vans? And then they walk out with a suitcase. But they're monstrous vans. And the answer is, many of those large vans have drying racks in them so that evidence can be properly dried before being stored and so and sealed envelopes etc so really kind of a cool thing to think about how do we store dna once we have them or any uh really talking about any biological sample in general we store them cold in particular at four degrees centigrade for very short term minus 20 degrees centigrade for in the uh, in the midterm meaning a month or two and long-term storage has to be at minus 70 to minus 80 degrees centigrade. Uh, some of these numbers should sound a little bit familiar to you because the new COVID mRNA-based vaccines have to be stored at minus 70. Why? Because the single-stranded RNA will break down over storage at higher temperatures. They'll last a little while at minus 20. I think the current estimate uh, by Pfizer uh, is approximately uh, two a week, seven to 10 days at minus 20, but it continually break down. Remember, it's not like the expiration date means everything is 100% until that date and then goes to zero. There is a continual decline in breakdown products until it's completely ineffective. So think about it from going to 100% to 0% over a 10-day period. And more than likely, it's not linear. So you should get used to this idea of bio things having to do with biological uh, and biochemical characteristics generally are not linear over time. 
So before we get to extracting DNA, we have to figure out exactly what kind of a biological we're dealing with. The three most popular ones are blood, semen, and saliva. Each of them has rather unique characteristics. Blood, of course, has a lot of cells in it. There's plasma, quite a bit of fat in the serum. So blood is an interesting one. We'll see a slide. Semen, of course, can, is only haploid, containing half of the DNA of the male individual in question and of course the DNA in sperm is very very highly compacted coiled and packaged into uh, a very tight solid proteinaceous uh, envelope saliva has a lot of DNA because you're constantly sloughing off cells from the insides of your oral and buccal cavities. But of course, saliva also has a lot of enzymes in it, which are designed to break down, uh, especially amylase, which is to break down carbohydrates. So let's take a look at blood first, something to recall. Uh, now notice what happens in blood. We've got in blood a unique situation where we have red blood cells, but also white blood cells. So here's our whites, there's our reds. We also have uh, platelets, which are involved. These guys here are platelets. There's the arrow on that one, the platelets. Now notice the purple color is where DNA is located. So white blood cells normally account for about 3% of the total cellular component of blood. Well, guess what? Red blood cells in the mammalian species does not have DNA. Remember, they are enucleated cells, meaning they have no nucleus. White blood cells, on the other hand, indeed do have nuclei. So white blood cells are the source of DNA in blood collected from the mammalian species. Why only mammals? Why? Think for a moment. Because in the classes AVs and Reptilia, red blood cells are indeed nucleated. So one of the great joys of working with birds or reptiles, if you are a geneticist, is a drop of blood contains approximately 100 times the amount of DNA as a drop of blood from the mammalian species. So just a little biological background. Obviously, red blood cells have hemoglobin in them. And one of the big things that we see is the use of something called luminol. A luminol actually detects the iron inside the hemoglobin within blood. Uh, it's a mix of thalhydrazine, sodium carbonate, and sodium perborate uh, sprayed over large areas. This is great for TV because it looks like this. And you can basically see when they glow, the you see this bright blue glow. Again, phenomenal TV. The trouble, of course, is remember that luminol interacts with iron. So if you happen to be cleaning a chicken or carving a roast and you drop it onto the floor, well, you're going to get any other kind of blood. Any other kind of blood contains hemoglobin. And so, of course, these contaminations can be animal blood. Don't know what you'd be doing in this particular hotel room here. Maybe... Maybe the plug is uh, attached to a uh, brooder for your chickens that you brought inside so that they would be nice and toasty. But there's also iron in feces. 
uh, very common, an old wives' tale a number of years ago, was someone took, uh, you probably, you may have seen it on one of those Facebook memes, they took a sheet from a hotel, a white sheet from a hotel, sprayed it with luminol, and of course, there were lots of spots of blue on it, and the meme said it was something to the effect uh, that never use the sheets in the hotel because they're covered in blood and or semen. And the reality is, no, they're not. <laughs> no, they're not. It turns out that many kinds of bleach contain quite a bit of iron in them. Now, why would bleach contain iron? Turns out that the final process in the purification uh, of bleach before it's packaged and sold to you in Clorox bottles is actually the, the bleach component is purified by passing it through a bed of iron filings. And so as a result, the bleach itself actually picks up some iron, and so bleach will actually uh, test positive for luminol because of the traces of iron that are contained in the bleach. This is one of the reasons when I was a kid, uh, my grandmother would always insist on buying Clorox instead of the cheap no-name brand of bleach because uh, whenever they use the cheaper, cheaper bleaches, uh, my grandfather's white shirts would get these little rust stains in them because of the iron in the bleach. There was so much iron remaining in the bleach. So just a quick update. You've got to know the chemistry. You can't just take at face value the information that TV shows especially show you. There's also a, another classic technique. This is phenyl, using a phenolphthalein. Phenolphthalein is a very, very popular pH indicator. Uh, it's a weak acid. It's orange when in acid, colorless in neutral, and pink uh, in a basic solution. So this is the one where your sample turns pink, and I know you've all seen something like this, where they have a clear solution, and they add the little DNA swab into it on TV, and lo and behold, it turns mystically pink, and they say, aha, we have DNA. Again, great TV, but what's it really detecting? What does it really detect? It detects a pH change because of the presence or absence of large amounts of DNA or blood. Okay? So it's great because it's non-destructive. It just it the stain itself changes structure to create the color change. It does not change any of the biological materials in the solution. However, it's the same reaction with human blood, with animal blood, etc. So you have to do further testing. In today's world, uh, no one does these tests except in a general uh, in a general manner, just checking very quickly to see what they can find. Uh, in today's world, what they actually use is what's called an ABA card. This is an antibody card. And uh, this is an immunochromatographic assay uh, for identification of human hemoglobin. In this case, they have an antibody that reacts only with human hemoglobin. Uh, they place a dot. Let's take a peek here. They place a dot in the well here and here. Into the well underneath this is a bit of uh, thin layer chromatography paper. The proteins migrate in this way based on pH and this portion of the thin layer chromatography paper is embedded with a human antibody. Uh, there, is, there is also a secondary antibody that will change the color. It is an indicator antibody that changes the color 
when you have a positive effect, and you can see a positive effect here, this is an internal control to make sure that we know the test worked. And of course, here is a negative. This is a sample uh, actually of animal blood showing that here is the positive control, meaning the test worked. But notice that there is no pink line here, meaning that it is not human blood. And so it's got a fairly decent detection limit. This, by the way, the ABA card technique is exactly the same as that used uh, in pregnancy tests uh, that you take at home and you can urinate on and it detects for a protein hormone in the urine. Uh, also, uh, curiously, Another reason, an, another manner in which these tests are used, again, contemporary, these are used for the quick or the fast uh, COVID test for COVID-19, where they can directly test for virus because of its interaction with a COVID-19 specific antibody. So it's a fast test that directly tests for COVID-19 viral particles in biological sample collected from you. Uh, what is interesting is that fast antibody test, by the way, um, as opposed to the direct PCR tests that were talked about in the presentation uh, about COVID from the uh, genetics meetings, is this is dependent upon how specific the COVID antibody is that was developed to test for COVID. So this tends to be, that particular COVID test tends to be uh, a bit higher in terms of identifying false positives than the others. Semen, another popular biological, sad to say, two thirds of forensic cases have to do with sexual assault. And uh, the one advantage of semen is there are lots of sperm, meaning lots of DNA, uh, except, of course, in males that have low sperm counts, and this can happen for a variety of reasons, uh, or have had a vasectomy. Uh, there's a bit of a misnomer. There were a couple of TV movies where they said, uh, oh, you couldn't find my DNA in a particular case, meaning the suspect, because I had a vasectomy, so therefore there's no DNA. Well, guess what? That's not true. <laughs> Just like your saliva contains DNA from cells sloughed off on the inside of your oral cavity, uh, any semen in an individual who's, been, who's had a vasectomy also contains cellular material that's been sloughed off from the inside, for example, of the urethra. So there's always DNA in biologicals. The question is how much? Semen, of course, is rich in both acid phosphatase, but also in prostate-specific antigen. And as you might imagine, there are assays to detect all of these things. Uh, this is actually a cute, I like to include this. Uh, this is an assay and a picture that I took. Uh, this is something called a Christmas tree stain, which is popular in uh, reproductive biology. And it's uses aluminum sulfate, nuclear fast red, picric acid, which is yellow, and indigo carmine. Uh, and in fact, you could see it's called a Christmas tree stain because it stains pink, red, blue, and of course, yellow. And you can see here, these are actually human stains uh, in a picture taken uh, under a microscope. These are human cells. And uh, we used to do this uh, technique when I was involved in the repro bio program uh, back at Penn State. Nobody does this much anymore, but I think it's a cute picture. Again, indicating that each portion of the sperm has a relatively unique biochemistry that underlies it. Where's the DNA? right here in the head, packed very tightly in the head of the sperm. Uh, semen is uh, a very complex biological. 
Uh, basically, the seminal vesicles contributes about 60% of the total fluid from the semen. The prostate gland about 30% and a little bit of uh, extra from both the epididymis and the bulbourethra. To give you an idea of volume size, the average male ejaculates about three and a half mils in every mil between 10 and 50 million sperm cells. So again, from a single ejaculation, you can usually count on uh, or nearly 100 million sperm uh, in any particular ejaculate. Again, this is human males. Uh, if we were to look at other mammalian species, the concentration of sperm from a single ejaculate uh, can be higher or lower depending on species. Uh, one of my all-time favorites, of course, is roosters and chickens, uh, in particular birds. Most birds, this is true. Uh, between any particular ejaculate, which usually accounts for about a milliliter, depending upon the size of the animal, and will have 10 to 20 times the number of sperm in the mammalian species. So a little bit of the biological background of some of the different species. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, how are, is semen identified uh, as opposed to, for example, saliva? Uh, one is to look in particular for prostate uh, acid phosphatase, and which helps us to look for prostate-specific antigens. So these are kind of two different ways. One is to look for the enzyme that exists in seminal fluid. The other is to look for a prostate-specific antigen. Uh, and uh, as you might imagine, for both of these tests, there is an ABA card that exists. And so um, uh, PAP is actually a colorimetric test, and there's an ABA card for PSA. Uh, thought I would show you this is kind of what happens uh, if we were to look at how long semen is detectable uh, for postcoital vaginal swabs. And here we have right at a zero time. Here we have our positive control from the ABA card. So we know that the assay works as long as we have this line here. And then we can see here at the zero hour, this is basically one hour post-coitus. Here we have 24 hours post-coitus. Here we've got 48 hours post-coitus. And this, of course, is 72 hours. And you can see it's a little difficult on this slide, perhaps, but there is a line here. So there is semen that is collectible and identifiable uh, from an individual up to 48 hours uh, post-intercourse, okay? So this really gives you a timeline. Uh, God forbid something happens to anyone, but in the case of rape, uh, you basically have a 48-hour window where you can collect uh, semen or sperm samples from an individual with a vaginal swab and to be able to collect DNA from the suspect. So really uh, an important timeline, something to remember. Again, if you're watching movies or TVs, uh, special victims unit, that kind of thing, uh, you really do not have to undergo uh, any kind of... You, you, this is a horribly traumatic uh, experience for anyone, and, uh, but you do have a little bit of time to get there and still collect evidence. Saliva, on the other hand, looks for salivary amylase. Notice there's quite a bit of salivary amylase, uh, 200 to 300, nearly 400,000 international units of uh, amylase. Amylase, of course, digests carbohydrate, and so it's very easy to identify and distinguish saliva from, for example, a urine splatter or a semen splatter. It's very easy to identify by presence or absence of salivary amylase. And uh, here is, there we go, 
here's just a little colorimetric reaction and you can kind of see here that uh, it, again it turns color I've only seen this used on TV once. I think it was on Special Victims Unit, uh, and do you, they actually use this to identify uh, a saliva sample from a cigarette butt. I have no idea if it actually works with a cigarette butt, but uh, it, it's one thing that has been used over time, and this was kindly given to us uh, from the West Virginia State Police Forensic Labs. It was a demonstration that they did. Again, as you might imagine, here we have another ABA rapid kit to look for uh, saliva. And of course, this is an antibody and you can kind of see right here is a positive. It's a little bit difficult to visualize uh, on the screen, but that is actually a positive. Again, we drop our sample into the sample well. The sample migrates to the portion of the thin layer chromatography paper uh, that contains embedded antibodies. And uh, it remember, because many of these samples do include uh, amylase as well, uh, it's a presumptive test, so it's not as clear as some of the other tests, but this is really an easy one to do. Of course, once we've got our biological, the question is, how do we get DNA from the biological sample? And there are a handful of classic methods. Uh, Something that is becoming very, very popular these days uh, is a DNA isolation method that I like to call quick and dirty. It, is, uh, it really relies on very, very simple sodium hydroxide extraction. It requires 25 millimolar sodium hydroxide, 0.2 millimolar EDTA, again, the EDTA important to stop DNAs from degrading any DNA in the biological. There's a reference here if anybody wants to take a peek. Uh, one of the reasons that this assay is becoming uh, so popular at this point in time is that the DNA that's extracted using sodium hydroxide technique Automatic, uh, no, automatically, it's a terrible way to say it. <laughs> the sodium, ex sodium hydroxide extraction ruptures the cellular membrane and the uh, nuclear membranes, releasing the contents. The DNA is now inside the, the uh, buffer media. And then very quickly, the sodium hydroxide can be neutralized with a second buffer. And that solution itself, with no filtration, okay, usually the cellular debris just falls to the bottom of the tube. The, cell, the supernatant, such as I'll call it, but the liquid portion of the extraction can be used directly for PCR or for genomic sequencing. So really striking in that where we used to do very extensive DNA isolations using what I call the gold standard of phenylchloroform extraction. It's a combination of both phenyl and chloroform, uh, which is made to both disrupt the cells, but also to solubilize the DNA and the proteins and the two different organic solvents. Then, of course, you extract the DNA. You have to dry off the phenol. Once you dry off the phenol, then you can suspend in either ethanol or in water, and then we can move down sometimes a column separation to purify the DNA into certain fragment sizes. This is kind of the gold standard since the 1980s for DNA isolation. Not many people do it anymore. 
in large measure because phenols and chloroforms are biohazards. There are safety issues working with phenols and chloroform. So uh, it becomes a really, really simple thing, especially with modern DNA technologies, uh, to do the quick and dirty sodium hydroxide technique. But I do want to remind you that each tissue type presents rather unique problems. Uh, clotting in blood, remember the DNA is only in white blood cells. If the DNA, uh, if rather the blood sample clots, what happens? Okay, well, the white blood cells are sequestered inside the clot and it's very difficult to extract DNA. Remember some tissue, for example, brain tissue or neural tissue is very, very high in fat. And so the, how does the presence of very high lipid content change our ability to extract DNA? Again, this is a situation where the phenol chloroform method was an advantage because all the fat separated into the chloroform portion of the organic. So it was a really quick way. And of course, gametes require special consideration because of the highly condensed DNA in the sperm head. To go even one step further, not only do you have to think about tissue type and the unique problems that exist in each of the different cell cellular matrices, but also what analysis do you want to do? In other words, what are you going to use the DNA for? So does the technique that you're using require high molecular weight DNA? For example, RFLP analysis. If that's true, then you may actually want to go through the trouble of using the gold standard. Phenol chloroform method of extraction. What if you don't need, what if it doesn't matter if it's a high molecular weight DNA? Well, then you can use the quick and dirty method of extraction. You can actually use this extract the sodium hydroxide technique here and then do PCR in a very specific gene or look at our, for example, the CODIS or the short-term repeat analyses, which require fairly small segments of DNA. Contemporary next generation genomic techniques are also uh, consistent with using sodium hydroxide extraction, with the exception of the Pacific uh, Biologicals or PAC Bio uh, genomic analysis, which the PAC Bio requires high molecular weight DNA. So if it's any other technique of next generation sequencing, affymetrics chips, of the alumina assays, etc., then you could use sodium hydroxide extraction. So again, this is just a, an indication that you have to understand the biology of the sample that you're using, the biochemistry of the molecules that are present in the biological matrix that you are extracting, and then ultimately, what type of an analysis do you do? So there's a really nice little decision matrix you can put together here to try to figure out the appropriate approach. Of course, you need something to compare, okay? And the most common way, and we mentioned this in the previous conversation uh, about forensic analysis, and these two are the ones you've probably seen on TV. Uh, again, buccal swabs are used very commonly, and there is a very stereotyped way of analyzing DNA from buccal swab. You actually use, uh, you use multiple swabs at the same time, and notice that you actually use one swab per section of your mouth, so upper, lower, left, right, okay, and each gets its own individual swab, and they are not combined. Alternatively, and especially those of you who have uh, had your personal genome worked on uh, by 23andMe, my, uh, my DNA Heritage, Ancestry.com, dot, 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 uh, any of the techniques, 
uh, everyone right now is using saliva collection. And basically, you have a very small tube here. Uh, it's about a, um, I think it's a 10 millimeter by 40 millimeter tube. And it's got a couple of mils of extraction buffer. And you spit five mils of saliva into it. You spit this way, cap it, mix it, send it back to the lab, and it's ready to analyze. So a uh, very classic way to look at uh, DNA collection. So I hope uh, you got some ideas uh, about how to collect biologicals, the individual characteristics of those biologics, and a, uh, an idea and some thoughts about what to do, how do you get the DNA out of those samples, and how it relates to the method that you'll actually use to assay them. Hope you're all staying safe. Take care. Wear your masks. And uh, I'll talk to you a little bit later. <laughs>